My first task will not be to introduce you, and is to actually thank David for so doing such a terrific job uh, leading the, uh, the Alliance for the last three years. So you and Bernie is one of the to world's top scientists. I mean, I'd say bioinformatics, but beyond. I've known him for about 20 years also during the Human Genome Project, and, and since then he's led the development of many, many important bioinformatics pro programs, software development, new methodologies, CRAM, Reactome, Bioperl, uh, co-founded Ensemble uh, Genome Database in the browser. Um, and but actually what I really wanted to tell this, uh, this, this crowd is I know he has been a strong belief, uh, believer in data sharing since the beginning. We've had lots of discussions at Cold Spring Harbor and other meetings since then. In 2009, we led a workshop on uh, uh, try to extend the, the Bermuda principles, which were about early data release for, for sequence information, to actually to extend that to clinical information, proteomics, many other data sets, and it's published in Nature. It's called, called uh, the Toronto Statement, and, and Ewan was a lead author. So again, a, a terrific uh, opportunity for us to, to hear to one of the best scientists and some, a strong believer in data sharing. Ewan. So uh, it really is an honor uh, to speak here, uh, and it's a pleasure to come back to um, Leiden. Um, and I'm going to give, uh, uh, my talk really has three parts. It has a kind of a, a scene setting part. And many of you know this, but I think it's worth going through this scene setting again and again, because our, our world is really changing. Uh, the second bit is about um, Emble EBI's um, engagement and what we see about the Global Alliance, what we're doing, um, and what we want to do in the future. And then the end part is going to be about challenges and opportunities uh, for the Global Alliance. So our world is really changing. It's a, it's a pleasure that our science, genomics, bioinformatics, is so relevant to human health and so important to that. It's a wonderful thing, but it also is kind of changing the way that basic research interacts with this endpoint of, of a really important part of human society that is delivering healthcare. And there are some very, very different cultures. And what I have realized and, and, and starting points of these two endeavors, and it's quite important to understand the other side uh, first. So if you're a clinician, um, uh, researchers, uh, we use one language most of the time, um, which is English. Uh, we have rather lightweight legal systems for collaboration uh, and for, for handling things. We do things a lot more just by agreement between scientists. We have normally open data uh, for non-human data. It is completely open, posted on the internet. For human data, it is as open as one can be, consistent with the consents that the patient signed. Um, we track ourselves by publications. Our money comes from grant funding, usually with best effort style um, uh, declarations about what the other person will be doing. If you're in practicing medicine, this world is extremely different. Most of the time in practicing medicine, you'll be using your own language, your national language. There'll be a lot of legislation and a lot of regulation. One of the most important things that a government does is deliver healthcare of some sort or set the environment for healthcare to happen for its um, uh, citizens. Uh, very often the data will be closed, closed just to the patient and the clinician, closed perhaps at the hospital level or the departmental level, um, sometimes at more open to the national level. Things won't be published, and the money flow is basically around contracts which are much, much, much more enforceable. Now what is happening globally is that our research is becoming far, far more relevant to healthcare. Healthcare needs the skills and the techniques that come from basic research. And at the same time, healthcare is going to generate a remarkable data set over the next decade. And we, as researchers, want to be able to tap in, use that, and create more discoveries and more benefits back for healthcare. That is the, the big, broad picture, but one's got to acknowledge um, the, the different places that these two, two worlds come from. Um, there's actually a real pleasure in, uh, first it's bewildering and then you find it's a pleasure 
being part of a European system. Because there isn't uh, uh, one healthcare system here, there are at least as many healthcare systems as nation states. Um, but as many of you know, if you're in the UK, the Scottish NHS and the English NHS share only three things, that's the letters N, H, and S. Um, uh, uh, the uh, Catalan government, for example, health is a devolved uh, responsibility uh, for a lot of Spain and, and many other regions. So there is a big diversity of systems, and those systems are fundamentally wired in a different way. And this, I'm just giving you one example of the NHS in the UK at one side, and I will not attempt to say that long German word uh, on the right-hand side uh, about how the German healthcare system works. But what we want as researchers is is the results of a lot of molecular measurements being having secondary use. So viewing this from a healthcare perspective, this is about secondary use of data, data that is generated primarily for a healthcare reason, but that can be repurposed to be used in research so that we can make discoveries. And I think of these as Janus data sets. These are data sets which face two ways. One way they face absolutely into the healthcare system, and the other way they face absolutely towards research. And we want to enable that dual facing role of these data sets. Um, and so uh, clinicians view patients as the people they are treating, as the, the goal of what they're doing. I view um, hospitals as uh, phenotyping centers for these wonderful wild organisms called humans, uh, which walk in free of charge to the phenotyping centers, get phenotyped by this amazing process, and then if I'm lucky, I can sweet talk data out of that phenotyping center and use it uh, for research. And seeing it from both of those perspectives is the key aspect to this. And there's a very large number of people or places that are, are really enabling this vision to happen. And we are part of the sort of umbrella process in the Global Alliance of trying to make that not just be hospital-led, not even that be small nation-led, but that being a globally-led uh, uh, process. I want to just touch on my own research very briefly, because I get excited about studying these wonderful vertebrates called humans. They're very good vertebrates, they have all the things that you expect from a vertebrate, and rather amazingly for these vertebrates, all the diseases they get are very, very relevant to human healthcare, uh, uh, because they are indeed humans. So this is a, a, a work that I'm doing with a clinician in Brompton, uh, Stuart Cook and Declan O'Regan in Imperial College. We're looking at uh, hearts, um, we have, in this case, uh, 1,500 healthy volunteers. From Declan and Stewart's perspective, this was the control data set for their cardiomyopathy data set. Now, admittedly, I don't think they would have done 1,500. Um, uh, they would have probably done 200, 300 if they're left to their own devices. I talked them up into, into doing something more like 1,500. But from their perspective, this is a control population so that they can also look at disease. But now we're repositioning this as well to look at just the biology of vertebrate human hearts. And so uh, it's a classic piece of GWAS where we um, take uh, uh, SNP arrays and we do imputation, the normal uh, stuff, but we're also getting a very high dimensional uh, cardiac phenotype using MRI scans. Um, and just to say one of the big problems here, and if I had a research talk, I would be talking through how one does this, is that the, the cardiac phenotype that we have is 27,000 dimensional phenotype. Now that's very high dimensional, and we need to have a very smaller dimensional space to do the genome-wide association in, and we use a piece of latent variable analysis, and this is plotting the first four latent variables that we can find. This is the left ventricle with two views of them, and the red-blue shape just says that human hearts vary in characteristic ways. So they vary with a combination of factor one plus factor two plus factor three plus factor four, and actually goes on to about factor 100. And then we can 
uh, do associations against those uh, factors rather than the original dimensions, and we get nice uh, QQ plots with, with good SNPs, and I will jump through all of this to show this. This is just one example where we're studying humans and we're repositioning a medical data set, uh, a data set that was generated for the purposes of human health, but we're reusing it just to, in this case, understand very basic things about cardiac structure. An interesting question was posed to me last night. Do we really need to federate? Maybe people like myself just charm clinicians in Leiden or in London or in Cambridge, and there is enough there. Maybe we don't need to federate any more than swapping papers and collaborating as scientists. The actual fundamental medical data sets can stay very siloed. And I think this is an interesting question to pose, because if the answer is we don't need to do this, then we don't need to do this. Uh, so it's an important research question to go through the steps. But if you're a human geneticist, if you're either rare or common, you will know that sample size is king. It is slightly depressing sometimes. You try to be clever, and you discover that just upping your sample size is much better than being clever uh, uh, in this game. There are things about common disease. Very often we talk about sample size in the, from the perspective of common disease, but I actually want to focus a lot more on rare disease. And it's great that Heidi uh, is here. I've hung out with both Naz and Helen Firth from the uh, DDD project in the UK a lot more. And I've really started to understand this, the, the beauty of investigating rare disease. So rare disease, at first glance, doesn't sound that exciting, because it's rare. But in fact, when you sum over many, 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 many diseases, it is relatively common. Uh, some of the estimates is that 8% of people will have uh, rare disease or be affected by rare disease in the family. Um, furthermore, every time, from a research perspective, we nail down that this particular gene is involved in this particular phenotype. We have an amazing point of leverage into a piece of human biology. Although that point of leverage was discovered only perhaps with a small set of people, it immediately tells us about other things, very often about common disease or commoner phenotypes. And people like David, many, many people have gone through this process. But to do this well, we need millions upon millions of people that are being screened and looked at. And in fact, we can tell that's the case because the Matchmaker Project sort of started, if, if Global Alliance wasn't here, Heidi, Helen, Kathy, others would have been collaborating in any case because their science needs to match people across with the same allele. And they know that the only way you do that is by having this massive virtual cohort across the entire planet. That is even now. So uh, and just, to, just to stress this, uh, the second match of precisely the same allele with the same phenotype, I hope I get this right, is transformative for many, many diagnoses. When you see only one person, you have to scratch your head a lot, and no manner of statistics will get you out of the problem that you've only seen one. When you see two with precisely the same allele, a rare phenotype, they're rare alleles, it starts to become very, very interesting, even that shift from one to two. But I want to say that, that sample size is not only important in rare disease, it's, um, I haven't kind of expanded this, but common disease, it is incredibly important. And something, uh, and that's also true in cancer. The, the process inside of each somatic tumor is so unique uh, that we are going to need gobsmacking numbers of people to understand the relationship between somatic changes, germline changes, and environment. Um, the, certainly those power calculations go way above uh, 10 million. 
But it's more than just sample size. I think federation is more than just getting a very big N. So the global reach of this is incredibly important. So one aspect of this is to leverage the fact that we exploded out of Africa and then different populations have drifted uh, in different places around the world genetically. And that, we can leverage that to our advantage. You can have a rare allele in Europeans and then you find it, it's at much, much higher frequency in Africa and you can work out then, or say in the Yoruba, and you can work out then that it really can't be that higher penetrant allele for a particular disease because otherwise there would be that disease at that level in Africa, all things being equal, or in Yoruba rather. The other interesting thing, um, and I've heard this from a number of people, is just how cosmopolitan we are. And I don't just mean New York and London. Uh, we are just becoming a cosmopolitan world. Um, uh, the people who walk into a clinic in Leiden may have come from anywhere on the planet in terms of that migration in history that led them uh, to this place. And to ignore that is crazy. And clinicians, geneticists, have to face this every day when they see people turn up um, and they're in the middle of Hong Kong and they have to do testing for Caucasians or what have you. Uh, it's, uh, 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 we are a cosmopolitan process. Something which I, I think bears some thinking about is the environment. And environment here is used in this genetics term, which means everything else that we can't assign to genetics, but we think is influencing the process, which is not a very good term for environment. Um, but it's definitely different. And I'm not sure that we're leveraging this as much as we can. Epidemiologists have thought about this for a very, very long time. And as a sort of side note, I think it's incredibly important that we tap in to these other fields that have studied wild humans for so long. And epidemiology is one of those fields that have really studied uh, wild humans. And then finally, infectious disease. Uh, we talked about this briefly. It's a, it is a, not a virgin territory. It's a complex area with a dynamic and a scientific community. But it's very, very obvious that viruses and bacteria don't understand about international borders. Um, and they just move wherever they want to go. So for both of these reasons, I feel that the Global Alliance not only is a good thing, it is a necessary thing for us to make progress over the next decade. This is the only way I can imagine this working, which is a federated system that repurposes uh, uh, clinical medical data for secondary research. So I just want to stop a little bit, well, not stop, I want to switch gears and go to uh, my own institution, Embel EBI. If you don't know this, we're just south of Cambridge. We're part of an international treaty organization called Embel, and we're sort of the moral equivalent of NCBI, though that's not quite the right mapping of, of, of everything. So we, uh, um, about two years ago, uh, when David was thumping the, the drum, uh, we made a decision that this was a, an important, critical component of the future. And we really want to make the Global Alliance work. I point out that I think our biggest contribution is this single individual. Uh, if you don't know him, you probably know him by email. He's Stephen Keenan. Um, he makes lots of things work inside of the Global Alliance. And actually, is Stephen there? Stephen, do you want to wave? Yeah. yeah. Could everybody give Stephen a hand of applause? Um, Stephen has a wonderful balance of social understanding and technical depth. Um, and that's quite a rare combination sometimes. Um, and so he can get geeky, as geeky as anybody, um, and talk to a bunch of clinicians without um, pissing them off too much. Yes, is that fair enough? Yeah. Um, the EBI has also been doing a number of projects. So we, uh, there is a joint project with the Center for Genomic Regulation, CRG, in Barcelona called the European Genome Phenome Archive. This is the 
If you're American, this is DB Gap, but in an international way. Um, and uh, uh, Justin's team and Arcady's team, Arcady will be talking later, have produced a beacon on top of EGA. The access or the, the switching on of the beacon is still something that is not a decision by EMBL or CRG. It's a decision by the Data Access Committee that runs it. Um, currently, there are uh, we have different layers, uh, levels of tiered levels of beacons, uh, two data sets, two DACs, the data access committees have agreed to a fully public beacon and there's three registered uh, uh, data sets and this is going further with many other people. I think it's just wonderful. We have a collaboration here and a technology that is compatible with global alliance uh, schemes and then we're making this scale and work over many, many more data sets. Uh, Ensemble has been working very closely with the API teams in Global Alliance, that's Fiona and Sarah, um, uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, producing uh, Global Alliance API, so Fiona Cunningham and Sarah Hunt. Um, and that's both in the uh, reference APIs, but perhaps most importantly, the annotation APIs of variants. Um, and this is a very important role that we see the sort of data at the EBI playing worldwide in the future. Um, and then uh, Vadim uh, and myself have been involved in this slightly mundane, <laughs> conceptually mundane, part of the dinosaur style approach to computing, um, but still is absolutely fundamental to the way we work, uh, which is file formats. And in particular, the Sam Bam Cram set. Uh, Vadim has been working along with James Bonfield at the Sanger on producing Cram 2 and then now Cram 3. This is a picture of the by, uh, bits per base stalled. Bam is the orange bar at the top. Cram of different sorts are, are the other bars. And about the third one down, I wish I had a pointer, uh, is our recommended Cram level. Um, we, cause we see no reason why people shouldn't move uh, to that level. If you really are paranoid, you go to the first one because that's totally, totally, totally lossless. Um, but, but that's a level of paranoia that I, I don't think is warranted by uh, uh, most places. Um, and this was, a, um, uh, again, about variation annotation uh, by Fiona uh, working uh, on how we represent the um, uh, annotation information on top of SNPs. It gets much more complicated than you think, especially with things like CNVs and indels. It is not some walk in the park, just look up which amino acid uh, this particular variant changes. So now I want to finish just on some reflections of the Global Alliance. I am a I am an enthusiast, I am a participant, um, and I also, uh, as part of the, the leadership of the EBI, I want to make this alliance work uh, uh, worldwide. So the good. I have really seen that Global Alliance over the last year has created a forum that wasn't present previously. I can see that in this very low level area of the SAM, BAM, CRAM formats. Nobody cares. I care uh, uh, about that process. Um, but also in the future looking aspects. And from this perspective, the things that I can see is the reference graphs. It's something that many, many people in the field, we have been talking about it for about 10 years, that a linear reference is just inadequate uh, to handle the human genome. The Global Alliance and the, the work being uh, people like uh, Benedict Payton um, uh, and uh, Eric Garrison and others have really changed this into something that is a prototype, a tangible thing. Uh, and I'll come back to this at the moment, uh, uh, in a moment. And so we've, we've, the Global Alliance has created uh, a a new space to discuss and agree. And let me just go touch on that top point as well, that it has a model between basic research and healthcare. 
I noticed the engagement by clinicians here and uh, healthcare organizations, all sorts of different groups, people who come from a very different end from the technical end. And I've seen many forums that attempt to do this and fail miserably. And I think it's really important that we continue to go from the very geekiest to the very clinical uh, in, this, uh, in this organization. That goes to, I think, a wise decision by the steering committee that the scope is manageable. It is a big scope, but it is manageable. And one of the pieces of advice I would have is to keep the scope in this manageable zone. It is extremely easy to kind of go off and try and tick off all the problems in genomics or all the problems in electronic healthcare record management. And there are many, many problems. And if one does that, you just will become too diffuse. By the way, I like to use the word genomics in a broad sense, because I hate the word multiomics. Uh, so I, I use the word genomics to mean measuring DNA, measuring RNA, measuring protein, measuring metabolites. I would encourage the Global Alliance to gently grow its scope in those directions, um, not feel that the word genome narrowly means, uh, or genomics narrowly means, uh, just the, the genome sequence. Is Global Alliance perfect? I don't think so. I think it's still growing. It's still got places to go. I think as an organization, that's a good thing. You don't want to be in some perfectly formed system. It'll never happen anyway. From a technical perspective, I think we've really got to push on implementation. Um, I worry that people can get too excited and too interested about the details before they implement. And I have seen many standards forums fail because it was a kind of a conceptually fascinating and interesting process that wasn't practical. And so for the technical people, we've got to implement, we've got to focus on implementations that work uh, for this. Uh, we don't have many funders in the audience, but for the few funders that are there, and I think as a community we've got to work out how to do this, Implementation requires engineers. It, you just, it does. <laughs> These things do not, like buildings, don't sort of jump into their foundations and build themselves and fit themselves out and do all of these other things. And so uh, from the leadership perspective, that means making the argument. From a funder's perspective, it's understanding that the forum is not the same as implementing. We need to implement. The other thing, that I'm not so close to this, many other people in the room are closer, but practicing medicine is a large and diverse group of people. And we need to have a long-lasting engagement process that percolates through medicine. I think if you try and do everything, it's hopeless. If you try to focus only on the people who really get it, you'll never move. There is some balance between those two extremes for engagement, outreach, and just bringing people in. I, I'm definitely not close to this area. I'm not sure that I have a solution. This is a, a challenge. And the final thing is that, for me, we have to be in it for the long game. I think urgency is really, really useful for motivation. But healthcare has been running for an awfully long time. Research has been running for an awfully long time. It is far more important that we achieve lasting change in five years' time, in 10 years' time, than we necessarily push our API release out in two months' time earlier than uh, for some deadline. So it's very important that we, we have the right horizon uh, to look at. And then some, we talked about this yesterday a little bit, the, what I would describe the somewhat ugly. Uh, so I am about as British as you get. I love America. Um, uh, I think it's wonderful. Uh, I love many Americans, even with their gun laws and their crazy healthcare system. Um, uh, I've traveled coast to coast. But we've got to admit that we are too Anglo. And we started that yesterday. And we're doing this at the moment. And being British or American is not a bad thing. Okay, it's not kind of wrong or anything like that, 
but it gives you a perspective. It gives you just one perspective. And you've, what I have learned over the years is that you've got to feel comfortable in hearing people coming from other perspectives. And what that means, especially about the, the ethics and the healthcare thing, is from other cultures, other starting points. So we need to acknowledge that diversity is good, and I think we need to stretch ourselves out of our comfort zone for that diversity, to, to embrace that diversity. Again, I don't have a, a solution to that, but I think there is a, a problem to be tackled. And then getting very geeky. <laughs> um, uh, so this is incredibly small hobby horse, but it's remarkably important for me. Um, um, so I talked a little bit about this between clarity and models, crudely Avro, and stuff that works, crudely old school. I'm very worried that we're leaving behind performant IO as a, as a kind of criteria uh, in this. So there's an awful lot of tasks in genomics where you simply have to ship an awful lot of data onto your CPU, do something, ship it back. Uh, and for the technical people, I don't believe we're tackling that problem at the moment, and I believe that's something that we've got to do. So I think I've taken up all the time. Oh, yes. So one more thing. I want to talk a little bit more about diversity. So in the perfect world, the Global Alliance would like to work with a collaborative set of healthcare systems, perhaps embedded in a collaborative group of countries, diverse set of systems, a strong biomolecular research community with well-worked-out ethics for access and strong electronic healthcare records. Wouldn't this be wonderful, Global Alliance, if we could find this place? Europeans, what do we want to do? We want an open forum to discuss and share state-of-the-art in genomics. We want transparency. We want to be part of the leadership. We want collective ownership. We understand how to work in a collective way. We want access to the world's brain trusts in this area. And we need to have the ability to bring justification and validation internally inside of our countries to governments, to review boards, and to regulators. So crudely, we have a marriage made in heaven here between the Global Alliance and people in Europe. Uh, so for my European colleagues, thank you for coming to this meeting. Um, but we need more. There should have been many, many more people here uh, from Europe, in my view. To Global Alliance, we need to stretch uh, and we need to be proactive in that stretching uh, across, uh, across that. Just to, uh, for, for, this is for Americans. Um, I want you to focus on number, number two. Um, is, is Andrew Morris still here? Well, hey, Andrew Morris is the Chief Medical Officer of Scotland. If you haven't got your head around data access in Scotland, go and talk to Andrew. It is remarkable. It is starting from a completely different place than an American or an English view of how one thinks about data access. The fundamental premise is that governments can use data to improve the process of how they deliver things to their citizens. It is a remarkable thing. It's the same basis to Denmark. Um, and it really is a massive opportunity. So if you haven't got your head around data access in Scotland, in Denmark, and in some other places, go and understand it, because you will be amazed about what this, how the system works. Um, and yes, just to, just to go uh, again, electronic healthcare records, if you, if you think you know how this works, uh, go to Estonia. Everything in Estonia is electronic. Um, they, uh, when they restarted their country post-Soviet era, they started it in a sensible uh, way, and absolutely everything they do is uh, enabled uh, electronically. Okay. Having said that we need to stretch, uh, I want to reaffirm my love of America uh, and that incredible bonkers enthusiasm 
that only a bunch of Americans can have somehow uh, to challenge completely new places. And you're there going, you know, guys, you, you know it's harder than this. And they're like, I don't care. I'm going. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going forwards. And uh, it's infectious. Uh, and it's a piece of an American culture that is worth having uh, uh, worldwide. And then just to say that it's not just about Europe and it's not just about America. Um, there is a huge amount of diversity around the world, a huge amount of places that this process is relevant to, but a huge amount of talent and on ideas and thought processes that happen in those other countries. And so I think it's very, very important that we celebrate and leverage our diversity in all of these areas, in how our systems work, in ethical social positioning of different countries, uh, and in ta simply talented individuals that are present around the uh, entire planet. So with that, I will uh, say thank you. Um, thank you very much for listening. I hope this was a useful talk. Um, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter uh, uh, if you want to. So do I, do I take questions or not? No, or do I? I think probably not. I think probably you um, should be ready over coffee. Okay. Well, except I. Well, okay. Yeah. Oh God, you're not. <laughs> Listen, you, that was an absolutely extraordinary panoply. Huh? That was really terrific. The range from your geeky origins to the philosophy of the world is um, <laughs> it, it's stunning. I wish we'd video recorded the whole. I, so I think we. Thank have. you very much. I, I, have we? Yes. <laughs> I think, yeah. So one thing to add to your, I, I, for, for me, the biggest single challenge is how we reach from a scientific, a set of scientific communities who really are beginning on a broader level than just the people here to understand the power of combining their data assets, how we reach into clinical medicine where they live in a different place. But the one thing that I think we should never lose sight of is that however conservative and inward-looking and narrow practicing medicine can be, they respond fantastically to being given tools that actually work. So the pictures that you show, the analogy that I like is if you look at those imaging pictures or any imaging pictures and imagine being presented with a digital output of that scanner, you get nowhere. They reduce the digital output to a set of pictures that a human eye can look at. Mm. I think that's our goal. Well, I, let me just say one of. One of. In my, you know, cl clinical medicine is also just very, very diverse. And though I know I've met many people who want, you, you know, it's a, it's a big, diverse community. And I, and I think we should just explore that. And some of the people, I mean, again, yeah. This is not where I'm centered. Many people in the room here are much, much closer to this. And, uh, uh, and we should take advantage of all of those connections. Uh, look, we are in clinical medicine in that sense. There are lots of clinically practicing people yes. right here. Um, it's getting to the people who are not, not here and will never be here. Yeah. Right, thank you, Ewan. That is fantastic. We are going to go on.